Hello, this is Scott from Optics Realm. This is Optics Tutorial 9. Optics Tutorial 9, March uh, 2013. We're going to talk about axial color today and understand why is it that a lens focuses at different wavelengths or different colors. When light goes through a wedged piece of glass, it disperses into different colors. This is what causes rainbows, and this is captured quite nicely in... Um, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, Moon album cover. And in a lens, what that means is blue light's going to focus shorter than the red, or it's going to focus closer to the lens than the red. This is called axial color or chromatic aberration. Let's talk first about crown glass. Crown, to make window panes prior to 1700, it was... Um, Glass was blown and spun on a large, on a uh, on a long rod here, and so it was blown and then it was flattened, and then it was spun to make a flat disc or a bullion. And there's a big blob in the center where this this rod sticks. This and this whole process was invented in France in the 1300s. It's kind of considered a trade secret. It was exported to Britain. Um, I don't have an exact date uh, for production or for um, window panes in monasteries where the rod was broken off and there was a thick piece of glass there and really people didn't like that thick piece of glass because it was a lump you didn't want that in the middle of your window and this glass was they, they pressed the royal seal or a crown into this portion and that's what gave it its name crown glass Sir Isaac Newton really wrote about and described, the first person to describe how wedge glass or how glass can disperse light. And he wrote about it in 1704 in his uh, uh, paper optics. And because his measuring instruments were rather crude, he came to some faulty conclusions in that no matter what glass you have, it's going to have a constant dispersion. And what that led him to conclude was any combination of lenses you're going to have color fringes around them, meaning you can't correct for axial color. As a result, reflective telescopes dominated uh, astronomy and other, uh, uh, other viewing for a hundred years. In 1747, Leonard uh, Leonard, if I'm enunciating that correctly, or Euler, he claimed the human eye has no chromatic aberration. We don't see that in our eye, and therefore there is a solution that exists to correct for color. Now, I think the eye does, I'm not an expert here, but I think the eye does have a little bit of chromatic aberration, but the, the brain filters it out. Let me jump to flint glasses. Flint, was, flint glass was created when George Ravenscroft added lead glasses in 1667 to prevent crizzling, which is deterioration due to a deterioration of the glass over time with uh, a bunch of cracks in it. And it's caused by lime, a lot of excess uh, alkaline salts. Now, Ravenscroft started as an importer in England, but lived in Venice in 1651. He returned to England, and he started manufacturing glass similar to the Italian Cristallo, if I'm enunciating that correctly. And Cristallo glass, they were very careful how they selected quartz pebbles from some of the rivers in Italy. And they would heat it up and then cool it with water and crush it and make a powder. And they went through all this elaborate process to get very pure, you know, not tinged with uh, different color glasses. So Ravenscroft exported this to England, and it was Sir Robert Plott. He suggested using flints of, of rock from Oxfordshire River, if I enunciated that correctly, uh, from this river in England instead of importing expensive uh, uh, rocks from the Italian River Po. Ravenscroft was granted a patent for this material in 1674 and he manufactured a lot of tableware. Melted flint glass, it's got a lower, a lower viscosity than crown glass, so it's less likely to have air bubbles in it and it had a, a two-minute working time and it allowed the uh, tableware manufacturers to blow this glass into molds. It was John Dolan that really made the breakthrough in understanding dispersion in glass and that a dispersion really does vary from glass type and it depends on 
what materials are in that glass. John Dolland was a he was a silk silk weaver, and his oldest son produced optical instruments in 1750. And it was his son that uh, wrote letters with uh, Euler talking about you know we'd like to correct uh, chromatic problems. Some accounts call him Peter. Some accounts call him John. I'm not gonna try and claim to be a historian. Just refer to him as his son. So Dolan joined his son, and he had access to large, large enough pieces of flint to perform um, dispersion measurements. And in 1758, he pub published his results in account of some experiments concerning the different refrangibility of light. Refrangibility really is refraction, or how light is refracting. That's a kind of an old term we don't use anymore. And in 1761, he was appointed as optician to the king. Now there's a very interesting backstory here. So it is purported that John Dolan is the inventor of the acromat, and we're going to get into acromats in another lecture. And I'll kind of whet your appetite. You know, you hear about iPhone and Samsung patent infringements, uh, um, monopoly uh, problems with businesses. In the 18th century, glass technology really was at the forefront for some of this patent litigation and understanding these technologies. And it is purported that perhaps it was uh, Chester Moore Hall in 1730, as early as 1730, that really understood how flints worked or had an inkling of making uh, an acromat. He is described as a country gentleman natural philosopher. And by a roundabout way, it may have been leaked to John Dolland. So it really, it was John Dolland that published and figured it out, published it first. But it was, it was Chester Moore Hall that, that uh, really discovered it. We'll get into this much later when I talk about acromats. It's a, to me, it's a fascinating story. Most may not care. I tried to explain it to my wife. She didn't care. Quantifying glass dispersion. In other words, putting numbers to dispersion. It was a German, Ernst Karl Abbe. He's credited with characterizing and measuring dispersion in a glass. He designed the first refractometer, and he created the Abe number, which we'll discuss on the, the next slide. He, he also ran in the same circles as Schott and uh, Zeiss. He, helped, he was co-owner of Zeiss. So here's glass dispersion. I'm, I'm going to describe it how it was originally found, and that is with relation to visible light. So Abe number, which measures inverse dispersion, really, is the green index of refraction minus 1, this n sub d, divided by the difference in the red index of refraction, sorry, blue index of refraction minus the red index of refraction. And if you have a low dispersing prism, like on the left here, it's gonna ha it has a high Abe number. It's going to have a high index, and the wavelengths, the different colors, aren't going to be spread out. As opposed to a high dispersion prism with a low Abe number, a high dispersion glass with a low Abe number, it's going to have a lower center wavelength, center index, but the, the wavelengths are going to be spread much, much more. Here's the spectral lines we're referring to. So little d is 587. That's one of the uh, yellow helium lines. This C is uh, red, 656 nanometers, and blue, this F, is 486. And this is generally referred to as where the human eye can respond. We use these uh, emission uh, absorption lines because the wavelengths are well understood and they're pretty stable, these, these typical sources. So one lab versus another, they're going to have the same wavelengths. Here's the Abe number, or the visible dispersion. What I'm plotting here qualitatively is the index of refraction in the vertical versus the wavelength in the horizontal. Blue, uh, 46F, to green, 587, to red, 656. And this kind of shows you, you know, this, this is an index of 1 here, whereas this is your index at D light. So this difference here divided by this difference, it's kind of a, it's kind of a bias term divided by a slope. That's really what dispersion is. I'll overlay the photopic curve, and you can see a photopic, that's what your cones measure, C uh, cones for color. You can see it, it uh, 46 to 656 represents that pretty well. And as well, I'm going to overlay the scotopic curve, which your, your eyes rods measure. It shifts, it, it shifts more into the blue, and that's for nighttime scene. 
And I want to talk about nomenclature. Abbe number, if you refer to a piece of refractive material and you say Abbe number, that is going to refer to the visible dispersion. If, on the other hand, you have a crazy wave band that is not visible, let's say it's UV to near infrared, you need to use the term V number. And, and again, V number, Abe number, it's an inverse dispersion. So Abe number may vary from 20 to 100, whereas the linear dispersion varies from 0.05 to 0.1. Why do we do this? Well, they started doing, they started these ca calculations before the advent of calculators, and it's easier to manipulate 20 as opposed to, you know, 0, 0.0 something. Friedrich Otto Schott, another German, he was an early glass manufacturer for optical instruments. He was a German chemist and glass technologist. I find it interesting, too, that he was the son of a window maker. He responded to Abbe's request to create a specific glass. And somewhere along the line, he invented a borosilicate glass, and he founded Schott Glass in 1884 with Abbe and Zeiss. Here is the, uh, a typical glass map. So we're, we're plotting index of refraction in the vertical. It goes from 1.4 to 1.9 versus dispersion, Abe number, from 100, and it's, it's counting backwards, so it's going from 100 to 20. There, we usually use an Abe number of 50 to mark the difference between crowns on the left and flints on the right. Now, there's, there's, I'm plotting glasses for three manufacturers here, Schott, O'Hara, and CDGM. Schott's a German, O'Hara's Japanese, CD, CDGM is uh, Chinese. There's also Sumita and Hoya. There are some more Japanese glass manufacturers. I've not included them because I've not designed with them. I don't know those offerings, product offerings very well. I apologize. I didn't want to put glasses on here that isn't readily available. Most of these glasses, they're substitution, but up here in the flints, these high index flints, there's not an exact one to one. But let's take a lens with collimated light coming from the left. It's going to create a bunch of different focal points at different wavelengths blue, green, and red. And we're going to denote the, the change in focal length from blue to red as small Greek delta F. And this this portion up here just shows how you derive what that is. And we're, we're going to start in terms of power. So very simply, and it's pretty much the same equation for power or focal length, and it's summarized here. The change in power versus wavelength is proportional to the green power divided by the Abe number, or if you prefer focal length, the change in blue to red focal length is equal to the green focal length divided by the Abe number. Very simple equations. Here's a quick example. Let's suppose we have a glass that has 100, is made into a 100 millimeter focal length and it has a, an Abe number of 50. What's the axial color? Defocus. Delta F is simply F over the Abe number. And in this case, it's 100 divided by 50 or it's 2 millimeters. And to prove that this theory is correct, I went to ZMAX. I know this isn't one of my ZMAX video lectures, but here's ZMAX. I, I took and modeled the glass with an index of 5 and an Abe number of 50. And I let the, it's a biconvex lens because it's such a high index, it's a long radius. I think this is a F10 or something. And constrained it to give me a focal length of 50, optimize the radius. And indeed, you can see the uh, value really is 100. And then I did a chromatic focal shift, and it's claiming uh, uh, 1974 microns, or approximately 2 microns defocus. What happens if you have a bizarre wave band, or a non-visible wave band, I should say? You know, let's say you're, you go UV to somewhere out in the infrared. Well, you want to change your definitions for Abe number. Your Abe number now becomes your center wavelength to minus 1, divided by the change in short to long wavelength. And these equations still hold. Delta power or delta focal length is this, the, the power or focal length accordingly at the center wavelength divided by the Abe number, excuse me, <laughs> the V number as defined by this equation. Now it should be noted that 
really going from power to focal length, you're going to have, if you're trying to convert from one to the other, there is a negative sign there. Uh, I'll harken back to the Newton's thin lens equation to show that. Here's some homework. We're asking you to uh, calculate the focal length, change in focal length from F to C light in a flint, SF6, and a crown, BK7. We'll be referring back to this example later. Thanks for tuning in. You want to get a hold of me, uh, you can email me at gmail my Gmail address or my blog at opticsrealm.com. I used to have a Twitter and iTunes. I've not really been using those. The homework solutions are being posted to the website opticsrealm.com. Uh, I'm not, I, I've kind of buried the links a little bit. I don't want you to go running to the solutions. I'd like you to try them first and if you're curious, you can go dig and find those there. Thanks for tuning in, and please subscribe to my uh, YouTube channel. Thank you.